What's up, y'all? My name is Ian Edwards, and welcome to the Soccer Comic Rant. And today we're going to cover the big derbies, Manchester Derby, uh, the North London Derby, uh, Leeds, Happy Southampton won. They didn't just win in a cup. They got some points mm -hmm. on the board, six-pointer. And uh, I don't know who's happier, Lee or Neil, because Chelsea won, and they hijacked <laughs> uh, 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 a transfer from Arsenal, and so and the guy was in the stands. So we'll talk about that. I don't know if Martin's going to join because it did not go good for his part of the derby. But we'll have fun regardless if he's here to make fun of in person or not. And uh, my name is Ian Edwards. Uh, like and subscribe on YouTube and send us your comments. And if you're watching or listening to this on like any audio platform, like leave a review. Like we get a lot of compliments like on, on DM style, but if you leave some of those compliments like on Spotify or iTunes and all that, it'll help. And uh, if you wanna get, you know, at me on uh, Ian Edwards comic on Instagram or on Twitter. And I just wanna introduce the usual suspects we got Neil Chelsea Chakravarti, stand-up comic, Chelsea fan, and uh, a little bit happier based on how his team did this weekend. What's up, man? How you feeling? I don't want to speak for you. You might still be unhappy. <laughs> no, I'm feeling good, actually. I mean, I was not that down now, even after the last game because I thought performance-wise mm -hmm. were good. But no, this is, a, this is a good win. What makes you happier, the hijack transfer or the win? Oh, the win, definitely, because the hijack transfer was just, you know, it's good for, I mean, I hadn't heard of the player a lot before, so, you know, this is, a lot of it is um, unknown territory, so I don't really know what to expect. It's, it's always fun to hijack, especially yeah. when it's I, from a, a London diver. I haven't heard of the player either, but if yeah. Arsenal was going to pay 70 mil for him, and yeah. Arsenal's tra track record of like recruits lately mm -hmm. have been so on point. Like Chelsea might not even know anything about it. They just know that <laughs> Arsenal wanted him. It's like, let's get that guy. Fuck that. So that's all you need. Yeah. And then we got Lee Hudson, stand up comic, Southampton fan. Who, Southampton's back on track. Nathan Jones is taking wins and shoving it and mushing it in mm -hmm. rude ass Southampton fans' faces and go, take that. You know, saying, I know what I'm doing in this league. How are you feeling? Always had faith in him. Always had faith in him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I mean, that, that was, that was, I mean, I'm sure we'll get to it. But yeah, it was it was a nervous one. But I mean, we needed that. Um, so yeah, I'm, uh, I'm feeling, I'm still nervous, but I'm still feeling, I'm better. I'm feeling better than I did last week. Yeah, I hope so. I hope so. You should. You should. Yeah, you're not going to. You, you want a six point and you're still at the bottom of the table, but you're only 10 points away from 11th, which is crazy mm -hmm. from what I saw yeah. when I saw the tables. Yeah. So at 10 points, there's three times 20 is what? 60 points. So there's like 60 points to play for. So, you know, it's not, it's not over. You got plenty of room for, for, you know, to get out of there. But I guess the first thing we should talk about is the Manchester Derby. And uh, last week we talked about it before it got played. And I was like, there is a chance, you know, there is a chance we're at home, number one. And number two, we have a pragmatic coach. Uh, we just have to, if we get the lead, he'd he figure out a way to help us keep it. And uh, the only thing I was worried about was our mentality. Like it, it has definitely grown. We, have, we are definitely a tougher team. Like we've beaten all the teams we're supposed to beat and that takes a certain amount of toughness to, and we've, we're tougher to score on. Like we've been immense defensively. And, but it's, this is Man City, you know? Last time we played them, they pummeled us like 6-3. They embarrassed us. Our fans left 30 minutes into the game, you know, that, that's pretty embarrassing. So, 
you know, we wanted to like, I, I was going to be happy with a tie. I was going to be happy with a respectable loss. But this win, Leo, like, I almost got it. I was watching it in my hotel room and I was reacting like I was home. And <laughs> people were banging on the door going, hey, man, what's going on in there? You know, I forgot that I was like out and that you can't be like yelling and screaming at the TV in a hotel room because people, <laughs> it's 6 a.m. in the morning, people just went to bed from hanging out all night in Austin. So you just can't do that. But uh, it was very exciting to watch. And I'm trying to figure out wh where do I start first? Uh, I think a lot of this loss is uh, Man City's fault. And I was watching match of the day and they showed you certain phases of the game where Man City players, even though they had the ball a lot, even though they won a lot of 50-50s and they had like 700 and something passes, there were moments where, there are three or four moments where they could have passed the ball to a streak in Harlem, just the same way we always pass the ball to a streak in Rashford and like lofted into those spaces and they didn't do it. And I think they were worried about doing it mm. because they didn't want us to get the ball and do it back to them, which is what we did to them. And I think us winning the ball early in the first half a bunch of times and like mm. setting Rashford off to the races kind of scared them. So it's almost like they were waiting for the perfect moment to pass the ball. And in a game like this, you got to take chances. And I think we kind of, even though they beat us possession-wise, like it's embarrassing. Like mm -hmm. we made them afraid to make that pass that they should have made to take the chance to win this game. Because if they got one goal early or two goals early, who knows? Even though when they did get the goal, we handled ourselves like immaculately. And uh I'm going to jump forward in the game because one of the things I'm watching our team grow like on a week by week basis, on a win by win basis. But one of the things that showed me a lot of growth is when we went down and I can't remember we, we went down and I can't remember if this was before we tied it or before we went ahead, but there was a moment and I think it was before we tied it. Like Ten Hag was going to make a sub. He's going to put in McTominay and like change things up. And normally the coach makes a change that gets you back into the game or gets you ahead in the game. But we scored before that, meaning the players on the pitch did the changes and what was necessary to do without him, which shows how much this team has grown. And how much, like what he has told them before the game or the game plan has stuck in their head and how much they remember and how willing and how deep they're willing to dig to like, it's normally Ten Hag would make the sub and then the sub will do something and the team will win the game. And then Ten Hag gets all the credit, but this team proactively like got that lead back without him or it was for the tying goal. I can't remember which one. Uh, I just want to shout out some players on both sides. Like Bernardo Silva is a pain in the ass in the best way possible of your Manchester City fan. Like he would come back to get the ball whenever we were pressing him and get them out of their side of the field into our side of the field. He was annoying all game. Uh, he was one of their best players. Uh, and Jack Grealish, there was a weird feeling when Jack really scored because I'm kind of like an underdog fan. So that when he scored against us and because I didn't really expect to win this game anyway, and we mm. kept the game at zero, zero till the 80th minute. And I said, right, this is the point we're going to lose anyway. I was like, if there was anybody that was going to score on us, I was happy for him just because of like all the stick he's been getting and people been shitting on him. And I was like, ah, at least, he's improving for them. Like, it, I, I was kind of like, in a weird way, like, all right, Jack, you got that off. People can stop talking shit about you. But uh, 
as far as our players, like Fred, I think he's still hanging out to uh, De Bruyne right now. Like if De Bruyne looks out his window, <laughs> I'm sure Fred is like in his bushes, like like not understanding that the assignment is over for the day. Like he was all over De Bruyne. Uh, Malasias was just immense. Like just, he was on Mars like another shirt. Like Mars was wearing red before Manchester turned red at the end of the game. Uh, Shaw played center back and uh, did an amazing job. And I'm going to start a, what do they call that? A conspiracy. Uh, so they said, so when, you, when they asked Ten Hag before the game, like, why isn't Martinez starting? And he mm-hmm. said, because Martinez doesn't, hasn't played a lot since he came back from the World Cup and is match ready. And I, I feel like that's one time when Ten Hag lied. I feel like he was worried about the height of Haaland for once and honestly, and didn't want to put Martinez in a situation where he'd be taken advantage of by Haaland's height. And then all the critics be like, I told you that short motherfucker could not play in this league. <laughs> so I think he went with Shaw, who's been doing good at center back and it worked out. So he protected Martinez, got Shaw in there. We did a good job and we still, still won the game. And Jamie Carragher can't say shit about Martinez being short. So I think that's why Martinez didn't start because there's no way Martinez was a match fit. He's, the World Cup's been over. World Cup ended last year. It's January. What do you mean he's not in shape? He's, this guy's a professional. He started immediately when he came back from Ajax and joined us. So I don't know what he's talking about. Uh, shout out to Rashford just for staying sharp and on point and hungry uh, and just getting us through this and getting us the goal that we needed and just fighting through an injury and just just being reflex ready for those passes all game. Bruno Fernandez uh, just starting on the right wing, which is not his favorite position, but doing doing the best that he could with it. And then later on getting shifted to the 10 position and doing his thing there and scoring the goal. Uh, Marshall, I was disappointed in him, but I hear he was injured. And so he's just playing injured for us. So fine. Uh, trying to go to the Ericsson, did his thing in the first half, but got a card and was taken out. And Garnacho, it's just, man, like, that's a big game. I understand you're coming in for the Fulham game and winning it in the last minute, but in a Manchester derby, to just treat them like they're Fulham and just come out there against all those names that are the hugest names in Premier League football. These guys have won titles and just go at them like he's playing for playing against like a Manchester United youth game and twisting Aki like that and making that putting that cross in for Rashford, like immense. And then uh come with Casemiro, just steady Eddie, baby. Let's get let's get some more steady eddies like that on this team, you know, Graham Sooners. Because if that's what you call a steady eddie, like that dude was balling. Like even the shot that Harlan was going to take, and he put his foot in front of the shot, and Harlan kicked him in the box at the end. Of, just be always being where you need to be, like a magician, just knowing how to show up, where to show up, if, like a mind reader, like just. All the experience just shows up. And uh, Ten Hag for just coaching a good game. Like, they could not get the ball to Haaland. Like, stopping Haaland from, like, being effective, it's not easy. It, we, it, we made their weapon their destruction because they couldn't get the ball to him. So then they kept on recycling the ball and going back and around and wasting time because they couldn't do what they wanted to do. And they didn't choose another alternative. Even the goal that Jack really scored, that cross was for Haaland, you know? So uh, I guess you guys can bring up anything you want to bring up about that game and then just continue to interject rudely and shit. Um, I mean, firstly, 
you're welcome for us uh, softening them up <laughs> uh, during the week for you. <laughs> um, but no, I mean, it's crazy. Like, it's, I think it's almost unheard of for City that, you know, against us during the week, they had zero shots on target. I know they had their big guns on the bench for half the game, but, and in this game, they had one shot on target and that was the goal and that was it. So yeah. that's, that's crazy for City over two games to only have one shot on target. Um, and to lose just to, just for City to lose two games in a row is unheard of as well, really. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it, they they it's crazy that they've got. Apparently, like, apparently, it's the first time this happened in a while, and it happened right after Pep hugged uh, Graham Potter. <laughs> there you go, right? It's con- <laughs> it's contagious. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I mean, it's it's. It's crazy though, I think with City that you've they've got a striker who is breaking goal scoring records. He's scoring more goals already than a mm. player normally scores in a whole season. And yet the team is so wildly inconsistent. Um like this season. I mean, you, you think they've been destroying certain teams, but then there's other games where they're just they're not at it. I mean, I'm just trying to look at the um I'm just trying to look at the table here, because how many games have they lost this season? Uh three, three games. Three losses, three only, points. So only, only they've three. only won like two thirds of their games. Yeah, which yeah, I mean that's that's crazy for for a Man City team to to be like that. I mean, Man United have played level games and they're only one point behind. Which I'm sure if you offered United fans that at the start of the season, they would have been overjoyed. Um, to yeah, we've won more City. games this season than we've won all last season, the complete season. Mm. Yeah, it's, oh. it's 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 nuts and. I think like the point you made was good about City just sort of almost overplaying and not looking for for releasing Haaland and things like that, and it that almost suggests like they are in their own heads a little bit as yeah. well. The way they're the way they're sort of just almost like the players don't want to take responsibility. They want to just oh, I'll I'll give the ball back to you. It's your decision, kind of thing. And uh, you know that's that's not what Pep's football is about. It's about they want to circulate the ball. They want to keep the ball. But then it's you need to then find the moments to cut through the opposition with those passes that break lines or balls into the into the forward because you know Pep isn't a stranger to having this big forward. He did it at Bayern with Lewandowski. Lewandowski mm-hmm. was his big forward there. Um, he would sometimes play direct into him there. Like he would get Neuer to just hit him. Um, and you know they've got a goalkeeper who can do that with distribution as well. With Edison, he can put the ball exactly on someone's head if he needs to um, or into space and. So yeah, yeah, it's 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 weird why they wouldn't do that, especially like you say, even though Shaw's been great at centre back, he's not a centre back. Um, right. So test test them, put Haaland on him, and and throw some balls up there and see what happens. Because you know Shaw, I think he's he's big for a left back. He's six foot tall, but he's not big for a centre back. He's average. He's sort of average height right. for a centre back. Um, and Malassi is not a big. So get Haaland over on that side and start putting some balls up there and causing some problems. But yeah, City were just a little bit too predictable, and I think. Ten Hag knew that and he was set up for that. Like I think he was prepared for them to have the ball. Um mm-hmm. and knew that. And I think I think he he prepped the play as well for that as well. Because although City had 71% possession or whatever it was, United looked calm the whole time. Like they didn't look like they were panicking because they didn't have the ball. They just stayed disciplined. Um and that that team's got a load of experience right now. Like you say, that whole spine of the team, like Varan, you got a World Cup winner in there. You've got Ericsson mm-hmm. who's played um at the highest level for so long now and 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 been around some big clubs. You've got Fernandez, who's just experienced and a good leader as well. You've got Casemiro and just that whole spine of the team. You just you, you, United never looked like they panicked, even when they went to go down. Like it was, it always looked like it was okay, we're you know, we know what we gotta do. Um mm-hmm. and yeah, like you say, Garnacho came on, changed the game as well. Um, Rashford informed. So yeah, deserved victory. Um, you know, you were more clinical, you were more effective. With what you did, um, you know, possession only means so much if you're not doing anything with it. So, yeah, mm-hmm. um, fully deserved victory. And that noise when Rashford scored the the goal for two one was like incredible. I felt that like coming through my TV um, when that ball went in. Like that was like, oh fuck that like Old Trafford hasn't made a noise like that for a while. <laughs> like that's um, that was yeah that was pretty crazy. So yeah, it was, it was a great game to watch and. Uh, um, it makes that top four race really interesting now because they're all bunched up. You know, City on 39 points, Newcastle 38, United 38. Um, that's really tight. And can any of those teams get close to Arsenal? I don't know. Um, Arsenal just seem 
crazy consistent right now but I mean Mm -hmm. we'll see how it goes but just to be comfortably in that group challenging is is, I think the big thing for United this season it shows a lot of progress yeah it's it's completely unexpected like for me they were never going to get into the top four and I was going to be like satisfied with that but to be here now is it's good but we'll, we'll still see like mm-hmm. i still say we're not going to finish in the top four it's got 20 more games left and uh we have a lot of dangerous games on the road with top teams like we played a lot of the big teams at our spot and now we got to go to theirs like we got to go to arsenal we got to go to newcastle we got to go to liverpool who that's a different game than just playing Liverpool, it's Man U versus Liverpool. So we got some of those games. And just, you know, anybody, any injury could mess us up. But uh, what do you guys, I wasn't going to bring this up. What do you guys think of this offside situation, Neil? Oh, offside. That's got to be offside. How dare, how dare. <laughs> like he's literally, he's literally like, you know, fondling the ball, like almost like he's, He's he's almost like escorting the ball, uh, you know, to the to to Bruno. To, to Bruno. Yeah, but, that's cool. But let me ask you a question. There's no way to defend as a defend like as a defensive team, you know, goalkeeper included, without accounting for that guy. Well, let me ask you a question. So they say play the whistle, which Akanji didn't do. And if was could Akanji get to that ball before Bruno? Because if Akanji right played the ball and ran to it, because he know he knew Rashford was offside, right? Mm-hmm. He didn't see Bruno, but he thought so. That's the thing. He was oh, only yeah, yeah, aware yeah. of Rashford. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I so mean, he didn't it's... see Bruno, and that's not Bruno's fault. Right. So he knows he's offside. Also, the goalkeeper knows that Rashford is offside because someone was making the argument that. Uh, the goalkeeper didn't know who was going to kick the ball, but he did. The, the goalkeeper knew Rashford couldn't kick that ball. So it, the shot could only come from Bruno. So it, it plays with the letter of the law. And I, I know it's kind of weird for sure, but as a United fan, I definitely... No, I, I, I hate it. I hate it when, uh, you know, prof- uh, footballers, they try and judge the game like your job is to just play it right like yes don't try and especially in the days of VAR even something that's clearly offside or clearly not offside could be could be the other thing so mm-hmm. don't try and get into that just play the whistle and um, yeah if that is what led to them you know dropping off and actually not dealing with it then yeah then they only have themselves to blame but I I mean at the end of the day when it's gone to VAR, I feel that should have been ruled as offside because he was interfering with the play. So why why didn't a Kanji, right? The ball's offside. The ball is also in your penalty, you know, in a dangerous area. You should, as a defender, want to get that ball. And yeah, just you, deal with it. You should deal with it. And if you run up to the ball and Rashford yeah. is blocking you, you will get that call. Yeah. But he wasn't close enough. I see mm. Lee... His face when I was defending it. So go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. Um, yeah, I, 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 I just mean, go grab my charger. Go ahead. Say again. I just go grab my charger. But yeah, go ahead. All right. Um, yeah, I mean, for me, it is it is offside. I mean, if that's goal scored against you, you'll be raging. Then, and, and if it's scored for you, it's one way you'll try your best to defend it. But. Um, <laughs> I mean, if Rashford isn't there, I think Akanji does have more of a route to the ball. He almost tried to like, almost like block him off in a way. Um, and yeah, the keeper does know that the shot's probably going to come from Bruno, but also he doesn't know what Rashford's going to do because Rashford could have just gone for the ball. Um, but it, it, for me, it's an inactive. He's having an active role in that situation. It's not like he's someone who's walking back from offside and going the other way as people are coming through. Um, so I, th- I, th- I think it is offside, but I mean, it makes it makes that uh, part of the table more interesting right now. So I'm not mad at it, <laughs> but I think good, good. Uh, if, if that if that is against my team, I would be fucking upset. <laughs> um, Listen, man, but 
Listen, man, after you softened them up for us, we had to score that goal <laughs> and not waste all that good work you did midweek. So you should be on board with this goal, man. That's all I'm That's saying. That's it, yeah. Yeah, and, and, you know, it made the game more interesting at the time as well. So I'll take yeah. it. I'm not, I'm, I'm not mad at it, um, but I think it was outside. <laughs> <laughs> You're muted. Yeah, it actually, it actually makes the table... Um... I mean, it kind of creates some breathing room between number four and number five. So, you know, you I, th I think United is at fourth and you have like a five point lead over Spurs were at fifth. So, mm -hmm. uh, and you have a game in hand. So this is a really comfortable situation to be in. Like you could literally be eight points clear on, uh, in the top four. I mean, it's, it's, so here's the funny thing. So last week, was reviewing these derbies and uh i wanted arsenal to win the, the north london derby the reason why i wanted arsenal to win the north london derby is because i didn't think we could beat man city and so my main concern was anybody that could catch us from behind which was spurs right mm -hmm. so then last week i figured i figured arsenal would beat Spurs and I wanted Arsenal to beat Spurs, but the moment the whistle blew for our game mm -hmm. and we beat Man City and we're one point behind them and we're a certain distance behind Arsenal and it looked like we could catch them, I started rooting <laughs> for Spurs. That's so what I mean, now, like you know, because you're essentially on the same number of points as City. City is still going for the title. Title. Therefore, right. you should still be going for the title too. Yeah. So. Yeah, so on that strength, it was like if City can catch him, maybe we could get lucky and catch him. So now I'm a Spurs fan, you know, <laughs> for that day. So <laughs> let's talk about that derby. Who wants to go first as far as the North London derby? Martin's team, again, just laying out in the sun for the first half of an important football match, getting tanned and then waking up and realizing, oh, shit, we're down to nothing. Let's do something about it. And we're at home. Who wants to go first? It, it was it was Groundhog Day, wasn't it? In terms of Spurs in a big game. I think, I, I can't remember who or they classified as. Yeah, I mean, I can't remember who they classified them as, the big teams as, but they said Spurs have played like seven, like top teams this season uh, between like the Premier League and Europe, and they've lost all of them. Um, mm -hmm. Because that's like, I... I you know, they say the definition of madness is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. Like, it's, I don't understand what this is. Like, that first half, like, Arsenal just dominate. That must, that's embarrassing to have your rivals come to your stadium where, like we were discussing on the podcast um, during the week, that Tottenham traditionally are normally better. This was Arsenal's first win at Spurs since, like, 2013-14 season. Yeah, yeah. Um, in the league and... Yeah, to, to to have your your rivals come to you and just and just dominate you like to that extent was crazy. That first half could have been four or five nil to Arsenal. Um, there was a couple of Spurs players that were lucky they were getting away with the amount of fouls they were giving away. Um, it was just incredible. And yeah, they were lucky they were still in. They, they were lucky they still had a game to play for in that second half because Arsenal should have been out of sight. Um, it was just poor. And like I said, it's the same old story. Just. Conte just setting up a team to let the opposition have the ball. And we've said before, you can't do that against Arsenal. Like they've got players like Odegaard will pick you off. Saka will pick you off. Like they've got these technicians in their team who can break down those low blocks. Um, you know, Partey will, will pick you off. Martinelli will pick you off. It's, 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 it's a crazy one. Um, I, I wish that Partey shot had gone in the one that hit the post. Man. Cause that was a rock. That was a rocket. Jeez. Um, I mean, yeah, and best goal in Premier that, League history if that goes in. Yeah, it would have been, it would have burst the net. It was it was a great hit. And uh, you know, second half Spurs, they put some effort in, they tried. Um, all the saves, because you know, I think Ramsdale was busy that second half, but all the saves were kind of comfortable for him. They weren't like world class saves, they were sort of in and around him. He could make those saves. Um, mm -hmm. you know, he still had to make them, he did he did his job. Um but you know, and then obviously the behavior, you know, I mean, fuck Richarlison. That guy's a piece of shit. Yes. Um, I, I don't like it, man. Fuck even even on the touchline, when did you see, have you seen the clip from the touchline when he was still on the bench? And nah, he was about, he, he, he was trying to go and interfere with an Arsenal player who was taking a throw in 
and Tommy Asu was stood in front of him and Tommy Asu just put an arm across him to say like, mm-hmm. no man, just like, come on, you don't interfere, you're a sub. And like Richarlison like threw his arm out the way and was just being a, a, a dickhead. And then at the end of the game, like Ramsdale had been getting abuse from the Spurs fans all game. Uh, mm-hmm. And all he did was like a little fist pump and a kiss of the badge. Like that's, that's minor mm-hmm. shit. Right. Um, and then for Richarlison to run in and push him in the face and and do all of that stuff, it's like, dude, you, like, you, you've just got, like, why didn't you show this much fight in the game? Like, if you care that much, play better. Um, it's you like, know, bro, you've been a Spurs player one week. Calm down. Stop acting like you're <laughs> from the academy. Like, like, yeah. like, nobody, we know you were just at Everton. <laughs> and then the behavior of those Spurs fans as well to Ramsdale, especially the one that, like, tried to get at him as well. Um, was that a kid? Just, like, it looked like a kid. Because he was, he you could was young. see him running back. He was youngish, but I mean, you know, Spurs fans, they're either stunted physically or stunted emotionally. So <laughs> it might just be, a, it might be an adult, it might be a child, who knows? Um, <laughs> um, but, you know, that guy should be... We sure Martin's band. back um, in LA, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, that guy clearly did too much cocaine in the, in the toilets at halftime. So um, whatever you need to do to get through a Spurs game, I guess. Um, sure, damn. <laughs> but, to get you through know, a Spurs uh, first half. Yeah, but just embarrassing from Spurs on and off the pitch today. Um, and, you know, we, we were saying during the week in the podcast that, you know, this was going to be the test for Arsenal, their mentality test, because they've never yes. um, in the last few years come and got a result here. Um, but, you know, I think it was partly the fact that this is a stronger, more resilient Arsenal that we saw, but also partly that they're playing the most unambitious Spurs team mm-hmm. in many years like you know Pochettino wouldn't have gone out and done that against Arsenal he would have he would he would have had a go in this game and Conte I just can't understand why he does this over and over again in these games and thinks that something's going to be different because I don't know what it is about him but I mean he's clearly just proven to be a bad fit for Tottenham I'm not even sure he wants to be there as well his contract's up he's not really seeing enthusiastically like he wants to extend that stay he's always moaning about the resources and stuff it's like did you like just google daniel levy before you take that job like <laughs> ask someone ask someone a question like what's dan levy like he's not going to give you any money um so and i mean you know he has had some funds to spend but i mean it just all seems like a bad fit there it's ugly football it's losing games um it's losing every big game they play and they've just got you know, I mean, it's only 2-0, but they've been pumped today in a North London derby at home and then just embarrassed themselves off the pitch as well. So, yeah, Spurs, what a day. It's, uh... the, the score could have been Enketia 4, Spurs 0. Like if Enketia yeah. had put away at least four of those five chances, it could have, that could have been the score. What, what do you have to say, uh, Neil, about this one? Did you check it out? Yeah, Arsenal's actually playing really well. Yeah. So, uh, because, you know, obviously they have this, this is the season where everything is falling into place and they've had a few challenges with Jesus being out. Um, I felt like you know, that might be a place where the depth gets tested. But I think Enkidia is like, he's not being, he's not being amazing, but he's done the job. Like even Jesus, like he was not getting a lot of goals. But he is making sure that at the top of the pitch, there's enough fluidity for everybody to be involved. I think uh, Katia is kind of like he's providing a similar um, uh, a similar effort up there. And uh, yeah, like I look at somebody like Partey at Arsenal, uh, Casemiro at United. I mean, having a player there, you know, that kind of a destra is just so important. That physical presence in the middle of the pitch. Um, yeah, you can't really do much in the Premier League if you don't have somebody like that. So, uh, and you would I, you would know you would know because that's those yeah, are the play, those are the two players that Chelsea is missing. Yeah, and, we've, and that's why we've they, and that's like, why they know, went and bought a winger. <laughs> yeah, we've been missing that for a while, but you know, just to stick to Arsenal. I think you remember how like when Liverpool got uh, Van Dijk and Allison in back to back windows, and that was kind of like the turning point. I think we're going to look back at the acquisition of somebody like Partey as, you know, where Arsenal moved on from being just pretenders to a serious team at the top of the table. Um, and, yeah, I mean, 
it's tough to see Arsenal do so well, but yeah, they they totally would deserve it. Like this is a season where City with the with the Haaland acquisition, even even at various times in the season, like they've been so good. But Arsenal now has an eight point lead over them, which is just which is just a testament to how good they have been. And you know, like you, as Lee was saying, like you come to uh, North London derby, you've not historically you've not been good in this game. They have, they don't change anything. Like they just keep rolling the way they play. They stick to their system. They trust, they trust the process, so to speak. And you know, things just start falling in place. So, yeah, this, yeah, this team. You know, it'll be it'll be fun to see them. I think it kind of helps them to just play like, you know, not have. Uh, to worry about Champions League. But yeah, this is a team that will do well in the Champions League uh, in the next year or so. And they're, they're out of like other competitions, right? Like which competition are they still left in? I think they're, I mean, they're, they're in the League Cup. Uh, sorry, the FA Cup. And what about Europa League? They're still in that? I would assume so, yeah. I'd be very surprised. And I think they're still in there, but I'm not sure. We'll, we'll, we'll check that. But Arsenal, man, they... Uh, you know, what, what Lee was talking about, what we was talking about last week is like, this was a big mentality check. We've, they've had the mentality, but there's certain places where you have to like show that mentality, right? Like you can't show it in some places and not in really important places. And they went to this really important place and yeah. showed this mentality. So mm -hmm. I never believed, if I never believed they could win it before, mm -hmm. I completely believe that they can win the title now. Because if they, it's 20 games left and it's a dangerous statement to make, but man, to like, to, the, the, their mentality is crazy. And then I was like cycling through their team because, you know, they could be like one party injury away from this whole party ending. Yeah. But then I was like thinking if party got injured, and number one, not only is he like, He's everything, technically and physically. Like, that shot off the post, like, I can't believe Atletico Madrid sold that. Like, mm -hmm. like, how do you sell something like that? And he was good at Atletico Madrid, but this is something else. But I think Arteta is raising the level. He's one of those coaches that raises people's levels. Like, he's on some clock shit right now like with these players, like their, their levels are definitely raising. But that, that, that shot against the post told me everything that I didn't know about Partey. Like he is better than I thought. And I didn't think he was bad in the first place. And Shaka, just the whole crew and Odengard again, like proving that Real Madrid made a mistake in selling him, even though they got some money for him. And they got some other mid, they could have used them in the classical today. Like he, he would have definitely showed Gabby and Pedri, who's like the new young kid in town, the way he played today. And uh, it's just, it's just the most impressive thing about Arsenal is their mentality, because it doesn't matter how much skill you got, which they do have a lot of skill. If you don't have the mentality, that skill, is of no use to you. But because they have the right mentality, they are displaying all their skill and that's what makes them dangerous. And so I just don't see their mentality slipping for, for the rest of the season. So it's a long journey. I know they have some injuries and I was gonna talk about the injuries, but if they, if Odengard gets injured, they have Smith Rowe, who is a monster who hasn't been playing. And they have that other guy, the thin man, I forgot his name, but it's a midfielder that they got. And also, if Partey got injured, they could slide Zinchenko in there because he has, uh, mm -hmm. he, and then and they still have two left backs. Yeah, and Zinchenko. Then Tomoyasu and Zinchenko tyranny. Tyranny. Yeah, yeah, and and they can so Zinchenko could play midfield. So the only if if Enkedia got injured. He was the backup to Gabriel. No, they're Jesus. gonna get somebody. They're gonna get somebody in the center. Right. They, have they, that they need to get somebody. Could, yeah, they, they mm -hmm. have the money that's just lying there now. So they're gonna get yeah, somebody. We, yeah, they got and seven also, like, mil. Martinelli can play as a center forward and they can play Vieira. 
um, out wide. Okay. Um, or, 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 they can, or, the, or, the, or they can play Smith Rowe out wide. Um, they've even got Marquinhos as well, um, the Brazilian winger who's a backup. So, mm-hmm. yeah, Martinelli can slide in as a centre forward if they need. But, I mean, I don't think there's any... I don't know how far Jesus is now as well. He can't be that far, maybe a month or so. Um, so if they can so they get low key got depth. Like one of the things that a lot of people think they don't have, this team got low key depth. So that's mm-hmm. the thing. Because, you know, like we don't have depth. Like our options are limited. That's why I don't think we're in a title race. And we're in four competitions. People are going to get injured. Like <laughs> we got 20 games in this Premier League. You got Europa League, FL, EFL Cup, and FA Cup. Somebody's going to get injured. Like we, we could taper off. That's why I'm still like, you know, that, like. But they have low key depth. So, and uh, as as it, I think the only other thing is that this is a team like everybody's so young, right? Like they haven't had that winning experience. So, as, as close as they get to the title, you know, no stuff like that might become an issue because Liverpool is in a similar situation. There's a team full of people who never won anything, but they had club and holding them all the way. Klopp, who's been a serial, serial winner. So they had that experience in the dressing room. In Arsenal's case, even the manager is kind of inexperienced, hasn't won anything big. So, um, yeah, it, I, you know, maybe nerves come into the picture at some point. Um, but otherwise, like, they've ticked every box so impressively that it's it, it looks like they're tightly to lose now. I was thinking that too, but then they have Zinchenko and they have Gabriel Jesus, who Jesus, have experience. Yeah. And then you could also count Arteta's experience, like winning as an assistant coach on the Man yeah. City. And did Partey win any of those La Liga titles? I'm with... sure he's probably won because uh, he was there for like a couple he... of years, right? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, he might have won one with Atletico Madrid. So the thing that I thought they didn't have, like just looking a little bit further, they 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 kind of have man. They got people who like talk them up, you know, and and I think they're trying to get the business done so that they don't have to worry about that panic down the stretch. And Man City is not is helping them with their results right now. Uh, hmm. Where do you guys want to go? They, next? they might get um, Trossard though. Uh, oh, for real? Yeah, because Trossard is apparently out of favor. At Brighton, he's yeah. not getting he's not getting any chances, and he's coming to the end of his contract, the end of the season. So, this is the yeah. last opportunity Brighton have to make some money out of him, and his injuries are being used. Arsenal have the need for a forward; they have all that money lying around. So, you know, I think it's a it's a it's a classic fit. Oh shit! Well, yes, yeah, even and he he's got the right mentality too. Hmm. So. Yeah. No, he's at the, at the moment he's he's been accused of having the wrong mentality. <laughs> no word. Um, yeah, him and him and the Brighton manager have completely fallen out. Um, they're not getting on, and he's been accused of being unprofessional. It's so weird though because Trossard had one of the best starts to the season. Yeah, he looked professional yeah. to me. Everything changed after the World Cup. It seems. That's oh, what was being it part with of that. the new manager? Uh, no, he he was doing great. He scored a hat trick at Anfield in the Zerbi's first game. Oh yeah, um, right. um, back before the World Cup. But after since he came back from the World Cup, he he hasn't. I don't think he scored a goal from since he came back from the World He's... Cup. He played some games, and then, you know, when Brighton went and smashed Everton um, at Goodison, uh, he didn't even come off the bench in that game. And he... they're playing. Um, there's this kid at Brighton now, Ferguson, Evan Ferguson, um, who's getting those minutes instead. And Mitoma stepped up, so they're not even needing him right now. Um, so yeah, I mean, he's, he's still a great player, Trossard, and I think he'll he'll be a good buy at a decent price for whoever does get him. Um, but yeah, right now he's 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 completely out of favor at Brighton, and they're not he's missing Belgium, him. right? <laughs> yeah, I think when you go to, to the World Cup and hang out with Hazard, it might cause <laughs> adverse effects. Just that whole Belgian squad seems toxic, to be fair. Yeah, like, they, yeah. they were a shit show, so <laughs> yeah, I don't think that was a good, yeah. Uh, so you guys want to talk about Southampton or Chelsea win in a minute? <laughs> yeah, yes, we, we can go Chelsea. What's up, Neil? 
it's a good game. It's uh, you know hard fought three points right till the end. Seemed like because it was just a narrow lead. It was just a one nil lead, and uh, yeah, even though we didn't concede a whole lot of chances, they were like they they were, they were popping these shots. I think somebody just that was probably their analysis pre game. Like just take a shot at Skepa. And but but Kepa came up strong today. You know he he got a hand to two of those shots, which you know easily could have been goals. They're going, uh, they're going in. And um, other than that, I think going forward it was again back to back to good performances um, from a creative point of view. Because I've been so disappointed with how bad our creativity has been all season. But both last game and this game, we created a whole lot of chances, quality chances, not just you know somebody taking a shot from somewhere. Mm-hmm. Uh, of course, finishing continues to be an issue today. Hall, again, he missed a great chance. Havertz missed two chances. Um, Aubameyang missed a great chance. Uh, Havertz finally, I, yeah, he, he scored probably the most difficult of the chances. He missed two absolute series. And then he, you know, he scores. That's probably one part of his game that has been good ever throughout his Chelsea career. His uh, heading ability, uh-huh. uh, you know, he uses his frame really well. He somehow gets onto these looping headers. So, yeah, that was a great goal. Uh, I'm still not convinced of him as a centre forward because I just feel like I've seen him at centre forward for two years now. Mm-hmm. And it's just like no aspect of what you would expect a striker to do has he improved on. So... Yeah. Yeah, I t- he's still a good player. You know, I still not try and like get rid of him or anything, but I just feel like that striker role, I, I sometimes feel bad for him. Like he's, I don't think he's meant to be that. Uh, just make him a 10. Yeah, 10, like, or like a second striker or even like an attacking eight. I think you, you know, you do well in some of those roles, but uh, yeah, he just, he just seems a little lost when he's playing as a, as a striker. But, you know, he got the winner today. Can't really complain after that. Um, Come to the rest of the team, Thiago Silva had another great game. Like, that guy, I don't know how he's still doing it at this age. But sure. he's, he's still just... He's, it's just insane that when we got him, he was 36 years old, and he's on his, on his way to having three world-class seasons, having joined Chelsea at the age of 36. Damn. Um, uh, Benoit, but... But the Chile, I'm probably getting his last name wrong. Benoit, he uh, he debuted as a centre back. Kulabali got a break, and he was great today. Um, tall guy, uh, you know. We've been having a lot of issues with uh, aerial threats, but you know he was heading out everything uh, in his sights. So that was great too. Uh, Where is he from? He's from Monaco. And you just bought him in this transfer. You just bought him in this transfer window. Yeah. I, I don't think the plan was to use him a lot right away, but you know, with Fofana being gone and Kulabali not having the best of seasons, I think it makes sense to use somebody like him um, you know, whenever we can. And he's got a great debut. Um, later on in the game, uh, Chalaba was really good at right back, even though you know he's 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 got a sort of a centre back thing right back right so he's not gonna have the threat of somebody like Reese James but he stuck to his man Zaha was uh, was there quite a fair bit so you know he did a good job Lewis Hall on the other side he's becoming one of my favorite players to watch mm-hmm. except that he can't finish like I think every game now he's had a couple of probably the best chance of the game and he's missed every single one of them. Uh, so hopefully he works on that, and uh, and he. You learns. could combine him with Marcus Alonso. Um, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. Alonso, like, yeah, man, like Alonso, and even Chilwell, like the kind of positions Hall is getting in to score. Those are the positions these two guys used to get in, and they're always like at least at the target. So, yeah, um, uh, Conor Gallagher, something about Crystal Palace really gets the best out of Conor Gallagher. Like, he's, he's not been having a good time in this period. Mm-hmm. But then again, I find it difficult to judge players because, like, the entire team is doing badly, right? Like, so, can't really pinpoint players. But today, Gallagher is really good. 
I think Gallagher and Mount kept interchanging a lot of the time and they were good. Um, Ziyech loved the ball a lot, but when he was actually, you know, he had a little bit of space, he was creating the kind of passes that Ziyech is otherwise known for. Um, but yeah, uh, good game, good vibe uh, with, uh, you know, there's a lovely tribute to Gianluca Viali at the beginning of the, of the game. It was great to see all the, you know, the ex-Chelsea players who played with him. The lineup, the, the video was great. And, uh, you know, Gallagher mentioned after the game that, you know, he, he kind of like brought a tear to his eye. So I think that was a good touch. And you could see like the crowd, I think the crowd feels a little bit of responsibility what's happening with this team. Like they're like putting in a little bit of an extra effort to get this young team across the line. Um, so yeah, um, Modric came up with a Ukrainian flag in the middle of the, you know, at halftime. That was nice. He was up in the director's box, uh, mm. along with Xiao Felix and Levi Colwell, who's actually, you know, he plays for Brighton now, who's above us in Premier League, but he was sat in the director's box with Todd He sat in the, he sat in like the loser's box. <laughs> and that was just crazy like, to see him, because he had a great game uh, yesterday against uh, Liverpool. Made some and, great passes. Yeah, and uh, he, he was up there today. And, um, oh, and the best thing of the day happened that, so the game finishes, 1-0, everybody's in a good mood. A couple of Chelsea fans on Twitter start this Twitter spaces um, mm -hmm. conversation. And there's a whole lot of people talking, you know, just normal Chelsea fans. Mm -hmm. And guess who pops in there? Todd Bowley. Oh, shit. <laughs> He's is in there. And people are like, is this like, you know, one of those where you like, just change the name and get get the blue tick. But no, it was actually <laughs> Todd Bowley's account. And he was in there for a while. Like he was in there for almost like a two, two and a half hours. Let me see if he shows up in a Twitter space after they lose. <laughs> but he shows up after they win. That's not... <laughs> he you know, he like... shows up after a win and after he steals a transfer. And then I think he wants to know. Like he wants to like, I think, oh, what these guys say. Are they praising me? Who they want next? So people like it literally turned out to be a uh, Christmas wish list kind of guy thing. Like when people realized who's on the space, like mm -hmm. people start saying, "Todd, if you're listening, we need a midfielder. We need a Reese James backup. Mm -hmm. All right, like Mudrik is all well and good, but we need we need mm -hmm. a DM." The people start talking about Enzo Fernandez, Mr. Boli, just pay, just pay. <laughs> I mean, you paid. 70 mil for somebody you don't really need, right? Or do you need this guy? So why didn't you just pay? If he can score a whole lot of goals, we need this guy because we haven't had a lot of goals from our followers this, mm -hmm. this season. So Yeah, that's a big but, if. But you got Joe Jao Felix. It's a it's like Yeah. Yeah. It's you got Jao Felix for a few months. <laughs> yeah. 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 But we have you know. Nkuku coming in next season, and that's already mm -hmm. uh, a done deal. But I, I think the bigger thing why we couldn't be paying up that much for Enzo Fernandez is apparently that's a release clause. Mm -hmm. So you have to put the entire amount, like the 120 million we're talking about, on the books right away. And that I could cause it. problems. With, no, but that could cause problems with FFP. The thing with um, transfer like Murdrick is it's 70 million plus 30 million in audio add ons, euros. Mm -hmm. But that's over, uh, that's why you're giving out these huge, long ass contracts, like eight and a half years. So you can divide that money over the period of the eight and a half years. So oh, okay. it's, it's more of an accounting you bought, magic. You bought, you, you bought him on finance. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's, you finance. It's long lease, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's, that's how most, most transfers are done these days as well. Yeah. Um, it's very rare that a team will pay the whole fee up front in a lump sum, like you say, unless it's a release fee, in which case it has to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've got to so. plug this phone in, so. Lee, if you want to start talking about Southampton, I can hear you. Yeah. I just got to plug this in. I mean. That, that was a great yeah. result, like, <laughs> I mean, six points. <laughs> Yeah, we 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 needed that. I I I think you could have relegated us there and then if we lost that game, um, because it was it was so crucial that we got the the points there. Um, and it was a it was a nervous one as well because it was a, a three p.m. game. That means I couldn't watch it live here. 
um, and I was I was driving uh, to East London for a show, so I had the live commentary on the radio. And I don't know what it is about radio commentary, but it makes me even more anxious than if I can see the game. Um, like it was, it was, it was tense as well. Um, Cause I listened, I listened on the radio at home for like the first um, sort of half an hour of the game. And then I had to jump in the car um, to head across London. And uh, yeah, just listening to that second half on the radio was, yeah, it was, it was tense. And I mean, it's great that we went one nil down and showed some balls to come back and scored immediately after half time. Because Ward Prowse could have scored in the first half, but Pickford tipped a shot onto the post. So it was good that he got one back. Um, and then at 1-1, the game was so nervous, like so, so nervous. They they had a bunch of chances. There was one on the radio where Calvert-Lewin hit a shot that hit the bottom of the bar and bounced down. And on the radio, when they said like Calvert-Lewin with the shot and the noise the stadium made, I was like, oh shit, that's a goal. And then they were like, no, it's off the bar. I was like, oh God. Um, and then they had a couple of that. There was one chance Ben Godfrey at the back post almost scored for them and put it into the side net in. So, you know, we, we rode our luck at times, um, but we were organized for the most part. Um, the players worked their asses off as well, which is what we want to see. And, uh, you know, it always helps having a weapon in the team like Ward Prowse. Um, oh, you know, it's yeah. a silly free kick for Anthony Gordon to give away. Uh right in territory where Ward Prowse can hit him. And, uh, you know, he did what he had to do. He hit the target. Pickford, I think, maybe could have done better. He didn't even dive for it. He was rooted, but he might have been put off by the the movement on the ball. Um, so, you know, fair play to Ward Prowse. And then, we, you know, we, we started this game with a back four, which we started the last two games with that we've won. And during the City game, we switched to a back five at one point. Uh, apparently, the players had a discussion with Jones about it because they didn't want to do it at one point in the game. He wanted to do it too early, I think. But... He switched to it for sort of the last 10, 15 minutes of this game. And it was the right decision to do it at that point. I don't like us when we start with the back five. I don't think it suits us. But in this game, it was the right thing to go to for the last 15 because Anthony Gordon um, had come on for them on the right wing. And he was up against Salisu at left back, who isn't a left back. He's a centre back who's left footed, who was being played at left centre, uh, being played at left back. And Gordon was running in ragged in a back four. So they moved to a back five, put Salisu in as left centre back. Pero came on to play left back slash left wing back. Um, and that sort of helped us shore it up a little bit and look a bit more solid. So the tactical changes are spot on again. Um, you know, in the last week, Nathan Jones has got yeah. everything right. The Palace game, the City game, and then this game. So long may that continue. Um, because It may have been getting, I, right, getting it right when you lost those games oh, it's just that <laughs> but it sometimes like your team has to learn how to do it right yeah even if you're like telling them the right thing it, it's like a growth thing so but yeah but you changed the form those those other games where we were terrible we started with a back five and it just didn't suit us right. um whereas these last three games we've gone to a back four so it might mean that he's taken some some either some advice on or listen to the players because I think the players have openly said they prefer a back four as well. So, um, you know, whatever it is, it's working. And, you know, he's learning on the job and growing because it's not a level that he's used to. But like I say, he he's learning. And if that keeps on moving in that direction, then I'm happy. Um, you know, I think the criticism he got was warranted, though, because the Forest game, I still you know say it was one of the worst games I've ever seen like in terms of mm -hmm. no organization no fight no direction nothing and then usually like improvement is gradual um like you see it sort of incremental uh but for us to go from the forest game which is one of the worst performances I've ever seen the palace game was all right but it was a win and then to the city game like it's like someone flicked a switch and we've mm -hmm. gone you know and won three games in a row which is crazy I wish they were all league games but you know I said that it doesn't matter if we beat City if we then go and lose to Everton and I'm so glad we didn't um, that bottom of the league now is is tight us Everton and West Ham all on 15 points um, so the, we're not technically rock bottom we're joint bottom <laughs> with two other teams um, you know Bournemouth only one point above Wolves only two points above Leicester only two points above Leeds only two points above um, you know it's all it's all to play for um, I would have been feeling pretty bad if we'd stayed on 12 points and we'd lost that game because I think mentally if you start seeing teams drift away from you it becomes a a real scramble and things become a little bit desperate whereas I think we can keep our heads a bit now hopefully um going into this relegation battle on our next games let me just have a look I think we've got Villa next um so yeah the next games are Villa 
then Newcastle in the EFL Cup, Blackpool in the FA Cup. So annoyingly, we've only got one more league game. Then we've got two cup games again, um, which is a little bit annoying because I think I want to try and keep this going, um, try to get some points. But oh, we've got three cup games in a row. We've got new, two legs against Newcastle in the semi-finals of the EFL Cup, the Carabao Cup, whatever you want to call it, and, and Blackpool in the FA Cup sandwiched in between. And then the next league game after that's Brentford. So Villa, Brentford, Wolves are the next three league games. And, you know, there's some good teams in there. Brentford can be a good team on their day. Uh, Wolves are picking back up, but they're games where we can feasibly, you know, it's not beyond the realms of possibility that we can go and get some points there. Um, so hopefully we can. And then, I mean, looking beyond that, Chelsea. So that's an easy winnable one at the moment. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I'm, not, I'm not, not too confident for that one. But yeah, it's, we're, we're alive. We're in the fight. That's all, that's all I care about. Um, and yeah, fair play. Credit to Nathan Jones. He's, uh, he's sorted out. Well, let me ask you a question. How many starters from the City game did you start today versus or this weekend versus Everton? Like how uh, much we does the made, lineup change? We made two changes. Which is pretty good because you guys went hard against Man City and then you went hard against Everton. And Everton's a pretty like hmm. you know, they, they, they're midfield, they they put in shifts. They just yeah. well, the, the the players we changed were the goal scorers. As well, Gineppo got benched and Sekumara, the forward, got benched. So Che Adams came in um, and uh, who was the other winger? Edozi. Edozi came in. Um, mm. So it was, that was an interesting, uh, an interesting decision, but, you know, it hasn't backfired. So Shea Adams as well got the assist for Ward Prowse's goal just after half time, and he played really well. So it might have been that he was resting Shea for this game because the Man City game... It wasn't a high priority, so he might have gone, okay, Mara, you can start this game. And, you know, he played well. He played his ass off in that game and scored a great goal. But mm -hmm. I think the plan was probably to always have Adam start this game because he's more experienced as well, and it was going to be a, a tense one. So, um, yeah, he, he did the job that was asked of him. Um, so, yeah, I can't complain. <clears throat> yeah, cool. I'm trying to think of, like, the other games this weekend. It was, like, sort of like Liverpool. Newcastle, Fulham, I want to... Uh, oh, yeah, you watched it. Right. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Mitrovic, Say that again. Mitrovic scored. So Fulham got a penalty. <laughs> and Mitrovic oh, yeah. scored. But he somehow managed to... I think they should have just given him the goal for being able to pull that off. He <laughs> kicked the ball with both his feet. Right. And it was one of the best penalties you'll see. Like the yeah. shot itself, it was, it was bang. Like the goalkeeper had no chance. But obviously because he used both feet... Um, just the slightest touch on the other feet, you know, it was ruled out. But yeah, I saw the, the highlight of that. And because I was like, how did, because I knew that Fulham lost. So to see him score a penalty, I'm like, what? Because when he ran up to take the penalty, he said, oh, he must have missed this. But then I see it go <laughs> in. So then, like, then you yeah. see it get called off. But he's like, all right, so he must have been somebody must have encroached and then say, like, nah, you, he kicked it off his foot. So then <laughs> that's an indirect free kick to the other team and like, damn. And then to, to see uh, Newcastle, man, just rolling. I think they've gone 17 games undefeated and uh, it was Newcastle, right? Versus Fulham. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. they also, like, if you look at their, they have the best defensive record in the league. I believe that. And mm. it's just, I think, 19 games, 11 goals conceded. That's just crazy. Yeah. You know, and then Bruno Guimaraes got injured. So yeah, we'll, we'll see. We'll monitor that. But everybody keeps filling in. You know, Joe Linton's up on a drink driving charge as well. Oh, he is? Oh, really? Hmm. Yeah. That Saudi lawyer money. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, Ezex is back. He, he scored, right? in that game. Mm -hmm. So he's back. Callum Wilson's back. Uh, St. Maximum's back. And yeah. So it was, <laughs> it's just, it's just, the, I would say the three best teams in the league just based on form right now, Arsenal, S Newcastle, and Man United. And the last two is not necessarily in the right order, but we'll, time will tell. 
but yeah. Yeah, United United are the only team unbeaten in the last five games. Right. Well, they say they say uh, that no, not just unbeaten, not just unbeaten. Like you won all right. five out of five. Right. Right. So I think next is oh, let me see who's next. Next is uh, Arsenal. Four wins. I would play Crystal Palace midweek. It's one of those the Queen died games. <laughs> so we got that. And then on the weekend, we got Arsenal. That's so, going to be fun. I mean, uh, the gap between you guys is eight points or six points? Six points, right? Yeah. Yeah, something like that. Six points. It might be eight. Is oh, it six? Probably, oh no, no, no. It's, yeah, I think I it didn't update today's points. So. Yeah, it's nine points. Nine points, yeah. They're eight from uh, Man City. Yeah, so yeah. nine points. But, you know, if you win that one, you come to within six points. So. Or at least draw something. But that's yeah. that's a mammoth game. We, we, we'll, we'll talk about that Thursday yeah. when we pod. Uh, just some other results. The Liverpool, what do you think about Liverpool's struggles, y'all? Ooh. <laughs> yeah, that's right. They got... They got bossed by uh, by Brighton as well. Like Brighton yeah. under De Zerbi are, uh, you know, they're, they're legit. He, he he took a few games to get his ideas integrated. Um, obviously, the players, you know, have to learn from a different coach after Potter left, and they're flying right now. Um, you know, Mitoma's come back from the World Cup and he's looking great. Uh, Soddy March, I mean, that guy's going to be getting an England call up surely because um, he's playing just immense at the moment um Danny Welbeck's goal as well like if Yo. that goal was scored by one of the top names that goal would be that going down as an all-time classic that was mm. so that, skillful that, yeah. that was like a bird in, Pele in yeah. against yeah. Sweden when he was like 17 years old in the World Cup final yeah just flicks it over the head and then the the calm finish as well wow like that was a hell yeah. of a goal um, and he's been trying to score all season, missed easier <laughs> ones, and then does that one. I'm sorry, Neil, I cut you off. Oh, uh, no, it reminded me of like so the, the Bergam, Berg, you know, the famous Bergam goal, where, you know, he turns around. Obviously, there's not turn around, but like, you know, just the skill of the first touch combined with the volley. Mm. Well, remind me a bit of did you ever see Paul Gascoigne against Scotland in Euro 96 for England? Oh yeah, yeah. Where he he flicked it over a head and then volleyed oh, it in. It was almost a little bit like that as well. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah. I mean, these are all great names that we're uh, comparing him to. So, mm-hmm. yeah. People need. To, I mean, Rashford. Oh, the Rashford. Uh, Welbeck's a weird one. Like he, he doesn't score for ages, but then occasionally he'll just pull a goal, a crazy goal out. Yeah. Um. And that. Yeah. That one. Hell of a goal. Hell of a goal. I think that's the problem with his career, because of goals like <laughs> that, they thought he was a forward. But he should really just be a box-to-box midfielder. And he would have had, like, a great career. Because he has all the energy. He's always running. And, yeah, he could break up play and tackle. Like, yeah. do the shit he's doing up front. Do it in the midfield. And mm-hmm. he'd be a starter somewhere on a on a legit team. But some of those yeah. goals he scored, people say, he's a forward. He's like, nah. Mm-hmm. He can't do that consistently. Yeah. Uh, what else happened this weekend that was, like, significant, like, as far as teams are concerned, like Leeds lost, right? Didn't they? Yeah. Sort of lose. And uh, there's still like a few points above the relegation zone. West Ham lost, Wolves, Unai Emery is like willing Wolves forward. They got a goal. Like a low scoring. You Lopetegui. Mean? Yeah, Lopetegui, yeah. yeah. Unai for Aston Villa. Yeah, I was just going to mention him too Unai they got the win mm. too who did where Villa beat again because I can't look at my uh, Leeds Leeds yeah, it was on, the, it was on the, that was on the, the Friday night the Friday night yeah I saw that but yeah so yeah man like maybe next week or maybe midweek we'll like actually go down the table to say who's where because there's only like a couple games to cover but We'll just like see where everybody's at and points wise, but yeah, man, this uh, it's it's weird. There are three teams in the top four that no, not that 
I didn't think Austin will be in the top four, but where they are in the top four mm-hmm. is that's a surprise. And the Manchester United and the Newcastle of actually being in the top four at this point, that's a huge surprise. And uh, Man City is there, they're second, but they look shaky. It's a shaky second, it's not a confident second. Like, you know, they've been losing games and they just gotta make that pass to Harlem. You know, like, just, just, I feel like, especially in the game against us, Man City, I heard Jack Grealish talk about how Pep wants them to keep the ball. And it was more important to the players to keep the ball than take the chance of getting the ball forward and losing it and maybe scoring a goal. It's like, no, we got to keep this ball. We'll keep it, guys. See how many wins you get with no shots on goal or one shot on goal. Uh, Any guys got any closing thoughts? Um, no, I'm just waiting to see who we hijack next week. <laughs> next time we're here, <laughs> you never know. Like anything can happen. Yeah, can you I afford mean... to hijack anybody else? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know. Like this, is something you know. One thing I will say is I want because the the dollar amount, like the you know the transfer amount of a lot of these are so crazy. Like. From what I'm understanding is like they're doing this long term contracts to make sure that they're okay with FFP, right? But still, like so many of these, we might actually go back to back record breaking windows. Um, like we, Todd Bully's almost spent half a billion dollars. Yeah. And we are not even through with the second window. And only one of them is a summer window. So, yeah, I am actually concerned that you're going to be slapped with a huge ass FFP punishment somewhere in the future, somewhere around the corner. Because some of this seems too good to be true. There's no way it could be legal. It's like, yeah, yeah. you spent more money, yeah. almost 500 mil, which yeah. is more than Liverpool has spent like in 10 seasons or something like that. <laughs> And so, yeah, yeah it's, uh, some, some, some just, phase is going on. Yeah, it's like going shopping yeah. with a husband's credit like, card. Crazy. Like I had all the things I thought of when I promised is going away. This is not the thing I thought that would be worrying me. <laughs> yeah. I don't think a hedge fund out of Santa Monica is going to be coming in and just like spending money on everything that they can, that they can see. Yeah, this. And let's you guys are buying players as if your injured players died and are never gonna come <laughs> back to play for your team. They're dead like, to you're us. gonna have so many players next season. You yeah, know, I don't like, know how we're gonna register anywhere. Yeah, like nobody's gonna get playing time. Like everybody's gonna be unhappy. And it's like, why are you joining this team that has, you know, but, but uh, you know, you're, I mean, you're got some shit to work out. But I think the good thing is, like, with all the recruitment guys we've gotten, I was a little worried that Potter is, are these even Potters? Because uh, so far, at least, he is our manager, right? So he should be getting inputs. And looks like he does have inputs in all of these. These are all signings that are happening at his, uh, you know, with his involvement. Like, the guy who actually took the, the, the flight with the uh, owner Baghdadi is Paul uh, Westonley, who came from Brighton to mm. work previously with Potter. So yeah, um, you know, if he, if that's what the manager wants and the owner is backing the manager, he can't really complain. All right, the owner has to back his own choice yeah. as manager after firing the Champions League yeah. when he yeah. manager. So yeah, he's like, you just, I like, I don't wanna be wrong. Let's spend some money, I don't wanna be wrong. What, yeah, you got any last last words, Lee? No, just uh, yeah, it'd be interesting to see how the transfer window rolls on, and uh, um, yeah, hopefully Spurs City on Thursday is a good game as well. Uh, be interesting to discuss that one and and see how that goes because I mean both both those teams are wounded right now as well. Um, mm-hmm. After this weekend, you know, it's two two derby losers going up against each other, <laughs> um, and one of them one of them's probably going to stay a loser. So uh, let's see who it is. I mean, for, if City lose three games in a row, that's crazy. Um, if Spurs lose again, then 
you know, there's crazy. some pressure. There's there's some pressure on Conte. It's not that crazy, yeah. but there's some pressure on Conte. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. And and you guys watched the derby, the 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 El Clasico. Mm. No, I did not. And I kind of noticed also that I didn't really hear a lot of it like online, like on Twitter. I wonder. I think because it's because the... it's not a league game. It was the Super Copa. And it was being played in, in Saudi Arabia as oh, well. Yeah. So I think that took took some yeah. of the shine mm. off of it. Oh, okay. Yeah. I realize it's being played in Saudi Arabia. Yeah. Yeah, they, they usually they... take it somewhere. Mm. So I was like listening to I watched some I watched most of the game, but I kind of dozed off because I was tired. But so PK's company put the deal together to play the game in uh Qatar, is it Qatar or Saudi Arabia? Saudi, Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia. Is, in, is in Riyadh. Saudi Arabia. Yeah. So he has some company. And I guess it's almost like a fight promoter for games. You know, mm. like, that's oh. what it seems like. He's like, like the Don so, King of football. The Don King of football. So it's like, <laughs> like he can like put packages like this together in yeah. those type of places so people can see teams they normally wouldn't see. And, and this whole Super Copa, thing is weird because it's the winner of the league versus the second place winner of the league versus the Copa. So the second place team in the league plays the Copa Del Rey champs and whoever wins ends up playing the winner. It's like some, so I don't even know if this is like a legit, it fans feels like- Is that a new they, format? Yeah. No, nah, it's, 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 Okay, it's it's their ahead. community. It's their it's their community shield essentially. I, every, I, I think every my theory is that the reason why they came up with this format is because they always want to make sure that final thing is the El Clasico, right? So and there's more chances of it being El Clasico if you give one of those teams a second bite of the cherry. Mm. But by you know if even if you have second in the because it could be that the the cup. Uh, winner is not, neither of those two teams, right? So you still want the cup winner to go through another group yeah. to get to the actual just, just, game. So just looking at it now, they they started it in 1982 as mm-hmm. just the winner of the league versus the winner of the cup, yeah, um, right. and then since since the 2019 2020 season, it yeah. expanded mm-hmm. to four teams. So the winners and runners up of both the Copa del Rey and La Liga. Yeah. I, I bet in 2018 what happened was they couldn't get the El Clasico, and then they, and then they, some, some marketing guy came up with, oh, let, let's let's try and do it as a as a semifinal, <laughs> and that way. Uh, and that's why Ronaldo was hanging out with them, because they came to Saudi Arabia, so he got to hang out with the Real uh, Madrid. Yeah, and so, and then just one thing, so Ronaldo could end up. Playing for Newcastle. You guys heard this? Is that this season or next season? Well, if they qualify for Champions League, probably next season because the mm-hmm. same the same group owns yeah. Yeah. Newcastle. So then they could loan him mm-hmm. to Newcastle and then he could end up in the Champions League. So that's pretty crazy. Th- yeah, that's fine. I, I don't some- think that bothers anybody, but you know. Yeah. Um, sure. But it just shows how calculated he is. Like I wasn't yeah, even yeah, thinking. Yeah. I'm, you think Ronaldo? You got rid of Ronaldo in Europe? No. <laughs> I'm back. I'm back. Like he he plotted his way the long way back. Mm. Like all right, I'll leave. You don't want me? Mm-hmm. I'll be back. <laughs> now you think you think Ronaldo's really going to Saudi Arabia to play in the Saudi Arabia? Yeah, because that <laughs> means if he's gonna play for Ch- Newcastle. If Newcastle qualifies for the Champions League, then he's going to be playing the entire Premier League season, right? So he's definitely yeah. scoring at Old Trafford. Yeah, he's he's rooting <laughs> for Newcastle. He wears a Newcastle shirt under his Saudi Arabia shirt. <laughs> like his kids it's probably, are probably one of his old Juventus kids. Yeah, it's hilarious. <laughs> it's funny. <laughs> well, guys, thanks for joining. Uh, this week, I'm glad we all won. Uh, Martin came over and watched the game. And he's, he knew what happened in the first half. So he, so we did still watch the first half because we I had to start the game after it had started just because oh. of when I got back. But 
Yeah. Did he leave via a window afterwards? <laughs> <laughs> he went out the door, but he was he was in a seat like this in a, in a <laughs> and a half, like. <laughs> Like he, he, I, I'd love to hear what his uh, thoughts on Conte right now. Yeah, he, it's it's he's not praising. It's not him. good. <laughs> he's not praising. Him. That's a clue. Yeah, he's not praising. Him. He's smart enough to not praise him. So, yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, well, thank you all for watching. Thank you all for listening. Hope you all enjoy. Uh, leave comments, and we'll get back to them. We'll respond to them. Hope you all teams are doing good. Uh, yeah, man. It's uh all to play for, for some people. All right, one. All right, let's do this. Hold on, let me stop the, let me stop the tape. How do you, stop <laughs> it, boy.